Hey, welcome back to the show. Immigration Equality is America's leading LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrant rights organization. Now, through direct legal services, policy advocacy, and impact litigation, they advocate for immigrants as well as families based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, or HIV status. We have now joined with us the senior staff attorney of Pro Bono Program at Immigration Equality. We're pleased to have Amitesh Parekh with us. And uh, Amitesh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to talk today. Yeah. Um, and I, I do want to take the time because we this show really deals with a lot of the inequities that people face and in, in, in particular groups face. And when we talk about the LGBTQ community, we know that um, there's a lot of people out there that are really dealing with several challenges. And when we talk about immigration, a huge issue. So for somebody that may not understand the depth and the magnitude of the challenge that we are dealing with with immigration, uh, walk us through the immigration situation first. All right, so thank you again. Um, basically, you know, it is a crime or extremely dangerous to be queer or HIV positive in more than 80 countries in the world. And let me just give you kind of an example, like a sample narrative, right? We have a client who is a gay man from Uganda. Let's just call him Ahmad for now, right? So Ahmad was one day just sitting in his house with his boyfriend and he also, I guess, apologies, like, you know, some of the information I'll give you in my samples might sound might be a little alarming for people, so I do apologize beforehand. But uh, so he was, so Emma was just sitting in his house with his boyfriend, and suddenly a mob of people broke into his house, into the privacy of his home, and started beating him up, all because he is gay. His family then came and did not stop them from beating him up. In fact, they joined in on that beating. And then the police were called, and the police again, did not help them, but in fact, arrested Ahmad on charges of being gay, right? And then a lot more happened in the story that I'm not going to get into, but that is basically the plight of a lot of LGBTQ and HIV positive people throughout the world. And so we were founded about 25 years ago to try to help queer and HIV positive people seek safe haven, to find safety, to be able to live freely here in the United States. And so that's basically why we were founded. Um, yeah. In addition, uh, apologies, you know, in addition, um, at least, you know, before the marriage equality, rather before marriage equality was passed, um, you know, same-sex couples were separated by unjust laws, unjust policies, and so we were also founded to help kind of reunite queer families, um, you know, despite these unjust laws and policies, and we still continue to do so. Apologies again for cutting off. Yeah, no, no problem. I, I appreciate you sharing. I think that for many people, uh, we do have a false sense of what goes on across the world. And I think when you look at America and we see our, a democratic free society, I'll say it like that, that where everybody's considered to be equal, you look around the world and you find that that's not always the case. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it is... It's kind of heartbreaking the amount of uh, homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, and serophobia that exists in the world, even in countries that you know might look amazing on paper, right? Let's just take Brazil as an example. You know, Brazil is supposed to be on paper, you know, an extremely progressive place. Like you know, they've passed gay marriage. They allow for people to change their gender to change their gender markers on even official documents such as passports, birth certificates. But on the ground, even though on paper it's apparently it is paradise, on the ground, Brazil is the most country, let's excuse me, the most dangerous country in the world for transgender people. Right. And so it 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 agree with you. Like, you know, it really is heartbreaking what the situation on the ground is. And you know, we actually do have to, uh, you know, like even in terms of immigration to the United States, you know, we we definitely do see um kind of trends in immigration to the United States. And and we also have to kind of update the way we work with our community in reaction to events that are happening worldwide. So for instance, you know, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan last year, it was in August, um, you know, we spoke to hundreds of LGBTQ Afghans and uh, tried to advocate for them with the US government. And so, you know, so it's, it's a constantly evolving field. Like, you know, world events definitely have a very huge impact on the way we do our day-to-day, -day, on, on the day we, excuse me, in the, 
on the way that we do our daily work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So give me a number, if you will, about the people who are actually seeking asylum, because we know that there are plenty of people out there that really are trying to strive for better and want to be in a better situation. What kind of numbers are you seeing when it comes to asylum? That is a hard question for me to answer, uh, mostly because those statistics are not really revealed. Um, what we do know is that, well, currently immigration equality is helping around 700 people in their applications for asylum and other humanitarian relief. But, you know, we are getting calls from thousands of people every month, right? And in addition to that, like in addition to just immigration equality, which focuses only on queer, trans and HIV positive immigrants, you know, we are also, like we also are very aware that, you know, there are several other legal services organizations in New York City itself. And they are also all at capacity, you know, and they also receive phone calls from thousands of people every day. You know, the way our immigration system currently is, the asylum uh, system, like, you know, there is currently a backlog of over 100,000 cases. It's, it's in fact more than 100,000 cases. That's a lower estimate, but you know, there's a gigantic backlog. And what the backlog is, is that you know, people who filed their asylum applications before 2018, I believe it was January 2018, are currently, have currently been waiting for an asylum interview that is for their asylum application to even be heard by an right. asylum officer for years. And that, and that wait just well, does not seem to end. Amazing. And the pandemic has caused tremendous backlog with these numbers as well. Um, and when we look at the pandemic and looking at navigating it, uh, how's it been for your organization meeting the needs of people in this time? It's been kind of a blessing and a curse, if I want to say, like if, I, if, if I'm allowed to say that, I guess. But, uh, you right. know, because of the pandemic, you know, we are now able to serve so, okay, so let me back up a little bit. So Immigration Equality has always been a nationwide organization and right? we've always had clients all over the country and we've always been able to do intakes for clients. We've always been able to speak to clients, you know, telephonically, but, you know, the pandemic kind of forced us to go on a more virtual platform. And so, you know, through, because of the pandemic and because of, as a direct result of the pandemic, rather, we've become more technologically savvy to put it that way. And we're able to help more and more people throughout the country. Right. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, the pandemic also kind of stifled resources. Right. Um, so immigration equality, one of the main ways we work is that we have a pro bono program where we work with attorneys at over hundreds of law firms who volunteer their time to help represent clients that that come to immigration equality. Right. But because of the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of law firms were not able to donate enough volunteer time to represent clients. And so we had several months where, you know, we just had clients in our program who, and we were unable to find attorneys for them. And so that was kind of a tough time um, in the pandemic, but we were luckily able to overcome that. And I wanted to go back to something because um, when we talk about seeking asylum, right? And the work that you're doing, some people ask the question like, well, how, how does one seek asylum and on what grounds can a person actually seek asylum? And when we talk about being able to seek asylum, I understand that if you're like lesbian, gay, transgender, queer, uh, intersex, gender queer, or HIV positive, that you possibly could be uh, a person that can make an asylum claim if you're in a foreign country. So I, I, I just want to correct you a little bit over there, right? So there's okay. a difference between refugee status and there's a difference between asylum status, right? Now, the way that works is, you know, if you are outside of the United States, what, mm -hmm. you know, you cannot apply for asylum because the only way to apply for asylum is if you're inside the United States. In the end, like the, the, the criteria for both are the same, but the main difference is if you're outside the United States, you have to apply for refugee status. If you're inside the United States, you have to apply for asylum. Now, the process for refugee resettlement and refugee status is kind of outside the scope of my work. We don't really deal with refugee resettlement except for in the narrow exception of Afghans. Um, but, you know, applying for refugee resettlement to the United States is an extremely complicated process. You first have to register as a refugee with UNHCR, that's the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. And then after that, they, like an organization has to refer you to the American Refugee Resettlement Program, that is USRAP. And then once they refer you, 
then, um, then the American immigration system will re-interview the client, find out whether or not they qualify for refugee status. And then there's a whole you know, other uh, kind of method of getting them actually physically to the United States. Now for asylum status, if you're inside the country, you can apply for asylum as long as you apply within one year of your entry to the United States. So there's that time bar, right? And however, the criteria for both refugee status and asylum status are the same, is that you have to show that you have either suffered past persecution, that you've either been harmed in the past, or you fear that you'll be harmed in the future because of, and the harm has to be related to either your race, your religion, your nationality, your membership in a particular social group, which I can explain a little bit more, but basically because of your LGBTQ status or your HIV positive uh, diagnosis, or because of your political opinion, right? And you have to show that the, your country is either not able to or not willing to protect you. So that's kind of the difference over there. And so walk us through a little bit more because you said you can explain a little bit better. So I'll, I'll let you elaborate a little bit further. Okay, so basically, you know, now, once, the, like, once someone applies for, uh, sorry, okay, so we were talking about the uh, membership in a particular social group, you know, so that's kind of, in order to kind of claim asylum on the basis of your sexual orientation, you know, in the law, it, like, there's no such thing that says you can claim asylum on the basis of your sexual orientation, which hopefully we've, you know, we are trying to change, but, um, you know, um, there is, however, kind of a broad category under which the uh, like under which sexual orientation, gender identity, and HIV status claims come in, uh, and that is membership in a particular social group. Right now, in order to claim asylum under the membership in a particular social group, you have to prove that you are a member of a group that should not be forced that be, that basically shares certain characteristics, and you cannot and should not be forced to change those characteristics. So, for instance, take a population of transgender women. Right, they share their they, like they share this common characteristic of being transgender woman, right? That is, they share a non-cisgender gender identity, right? And they cannot be forced to change that. You cannot change someone's gender identity, right? And so, I mean, you cannot outwardly change someone's gender identity. You cannot force someone to change their gender identity is what I mean to say, right? And so, and, and so they would basically count as a particular social group for purposes of asylum. And that's basically what that means. I see. Well, I want to talk a little bit about your strategic plan. There is a 2020 to 2023 strategic plan that's been launched uh, to better serve your clients and your clientele. Uh, give us a little bit more into your strategic plan. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that question. So basically, you know, um, when uh, as we're representing clients, we we kind of we provide as, as you know, like, you know, we provide free legal services to clients in need and we're currently representing around 700 people. We hope to continue doing that and we hope to kind of expand our services to help more people if possible. Right? Then we also have a detention program where we're hearing from thousands of people in detention and we're trying to get them out of detention. You know, immigration detention is a terrible place for queer, trans, and HIV positive immigrants. Um, you know, there have been reports of medical neglect. You know, People living with HIV are not given access to medication. We have a client who uh, when they entered the country, they told immigration that they are a person living with HIV. Their medication was taken away from them, and then they were not given medication for a month. And then when they were given medication after that month, it was the wrong medication. They had a severe reaction to it. And then they were given the right medication, but it was the wrong dosage of the medication. So basically, it took them three months to get life-saving HIV medication. Right? And so immigration is just absolutely unsafe for immigrants living with HIV, for transgender, like for, for transgender people, for queer people. And so um, it is our goal to have immigration agreed that no queer, trans, or HIV positive person should be detained by immigration detention. And that's something that we hope to work on in the next few years. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, we hope to continue trying to get people out of detention as much as possible and also help them with their applications for asylum. And then we also hope to you know, um, kind of advocate for you know, by, um, so by doing a direct representation, we, we are sometimes able to see, like, you know, uh, if there are any unjust laws and policies that directly impact our clients or even indirectly impact our clients, you know, and so through advocacy, we also hope to try to change such laws and policies. And I can give you an example of one that we hope to change in the next two years. Um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, an, an immigration identity document can sometimes be the only identity document that an immigrant has, right? And for transgender applicants, uh, for transgender immigrants rather, um, 
sometimes that can be the only identity document that has their gender identity listed on there. So for instance, say a transgender woman from Mexico, right? Her passport says that her, her, her passport refers to her as male, her birth certificate refers to her as male, but she is pro like she is able to get an immigration document that like, you know that shows her correct gender marker as female on her document. And however, in order to get that correct gender marker, immigration has placed very high burdens on the on the applicant. Basically what they have said is that this tra that this transgender woman from Mexico would either have to get a medical letter, or a court order showing that her gender marker should be female. Now, you know, a lot of our clients don't have access to gender affirming medical care, you know, and a lot of our clients definitely don't have the resources to seek a court order to that effect, right? right. And so we're trying to get immigration to agree that transgender applicants or non-binary applicants or people of different genders should be just allowed to self-attest that actually I am female and I don't need to give any proof of that of the fact that I'm female. You know, uh, because in the end, it like someone's gender identity doesn't really matter when immigration is deciding on a work permit application. Like that is not the basis of that application, so it really shouldn't matter. So that is something that we're also trying to work on. Yeah, and how optimistic are you with uh, these initiatives going forward that uh, you can see some sufficient turnaround in these legislations and things that are out there? Uh, I <laughs> I want to say I'm semi optimistic. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, since the Biden administration, or rather, since uh, like you know, since since President Biden took office, it they have made a number of changes to immigration laws and policies. Something that uh, that advocates like immigration equality have been pushing for for years, right? Um, for instance, like you know, now the Biden administration, like rather the state, there is a lot that that goes into this, but like you know, the, we had several lawsuits against a discriminatory state department policy that denied birthright citizenship to children of same-sex couples. Um, and so, you know, we fought this in court, we litigated it, and we won. Every single time that we fought this in court, we won. And, you know, we've been pushing the administration for years now to change this policy. And finally, the Biden administration changed the policy, right? It was in, I believe in May, 2021, they changed this policy. And, you know, there's an around the whole, um, you know, uh, around the whole self-attestation of gender identity, there actually is a huge push from, from immigrants' rights organizations, from queer rights organizations to have immigration just let people self-identify their gender. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this is something that will happen in the near future. Yeah. And so as we look at it, set our sights towards the future, uh, here in 2023, any, uh, 2023, 2022, <laughs> what are, uh, are there any particular things that you're looking out for specifically? Um, I guess the uh, certain things that we're looking out for specifically are, you know, we really are hoping that the Biden administration, uh, you know, makes a pathway for queer Afghans and HIV positive Afghans to come to safety in the United States. You know, we left Afghanistan we should make a pathway for these people to be safely relocated to the United States. In addition, what we're really hoping for, again, is like, you know, making sure that the Biden administration agrees, that, that, that immigration agrees, that queer and HIV positive immigrants not be ever detained, or rather there be kind of a presumption that they should not be detained. You know, so these are kind of two of the things that we are really focusing on right now. So for people who want more information and can get connected to the work and the services that you do, how do people go about it? Uh, and if they're here and they're saying, listen, you know, I do need a voice, I do need some advocacy, how can they, how can they connect? You know, uh, the, the best way to connect to us, uh, if, if you're looking for immigration services, reach out to us via our website. We have an inquiry form on there. Um, but, you know, if you're just interested in supporting our work, you know, I, 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 I think the best way to do that is, you know, to make sure that your elected officials know that the issue of queer immigrants and the issue, and the issue of immigrants living with HIV is important to you, right? Like, make sure that you look at the immigration platform of the of the candidate that you support and make sure that it is queer immigrant friendly, right? Um, like, let the Biden administration know that the that it is important to you that queer Afghans are resettled in the United States. Like, let them know that you know. Um, that uh, that you want the administration to expeditiously resettle uh, like queer people, be it from Afghanistan, be it from the Ukraine. Now, you know, you want to resettle them to the United States and provide a pathway for that resettlement. And also, you know, 
always donate to legal services organizations like us so that we can increase our capacity and also help serve more people. These are just some of the few things that you can do. All right. Well, Natasha, we got to leave it there, but thank you so much for being with us and sharing uh, some great information and bringing us a new perspective when it comes to the inequities that so many people face. Thank you uh, for the work that you're doing and thank you for making us more aware. Thank you so much.